Hi, this is Brett Senkis with Senkis Law and Brayton Woods. I'm an M&A advisor and an M&A lawyer. If you like this video, check out merger-resources.com. There's all sorts of videos, articles, templates, checklists, tools, all about mergers and acquisitions and all free all the time, so check it out. Today we're talking about M&A motivations. We're talking about it from the buyer's perspective. So why buyers decide to purchase companies. Why a, a, one business will buy another business, acquire another business. M&A, reasons for M&A, okay? And I group these, I, there's all sorts of reasons and there's overlap between them and nuances, but, but I'm gonna give you the lay of the land as well as I can. I'm gonna group all these reasons or motivations into three categories. The first, and that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. The others we'll talk about in future videos, but the ones we're going to talk about today are synergy, so synergistic reasons. There's also expansion-oriented reasons, and then there's a miscellaneous category. So there's a one, two, and three, three great categories, and in each of those categories, I have four uh, individual reasons. So, uh, you know, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, okay? So synergy is the first one we're going to tackle. So buyers often will purchase companies for reasons of synergy. And you'll hear this a lot when you read about M&A, particularly in the public market. Synergy is this huge buzzword, but it's been around for long enough that it's, it's, it's not going away. So synergy just means that the combined entity, the companies together, two companies usually together, are worth more than they would be individually, or they're more valuable in some manner, right? The, the sum of the parts is better than the individual, excuse me, the whole is worth more than the sum of the parts, I think is the way that goes. So there's four different kinds of synergy. Now one is synergy through consolidation or cost cutting or cost savings. And this is one of the easier types of synergy to recognize, still not simple, but you'll hear about it all the time. And so what happens is uh, if, if two similar sized companies come together, they will often have redundancies. So not very politically popular, but it's capitalism. You know, it's, it's, it's putting two companies together. Some jobs will be lost. Not all the time, but often they will because there's overhead. So uh, if two public companies merge, you don't need two CEOs and two CFOs and two CMOs. So some people will be uh, made redundant and, and let go. There's also uh, sometimes the research and development function can be combined. Sometimes there's efficiencies in terms of marketing. You know, there's just, we can run these two companies you know, the two independent companies can be run as one and we can not have to duplicate all of our functions. So it's cost savings. Now, those are pretty easy to identify. So you'll see them talked about a lot, particularly in the public company markets. And they're fairly easy to realize. I mean, it's fairly easy just to cut a job or to, uh, yeah, to cut some overhead or to slash some spending. What's not easy is to predict the externalities or what will come from those cuts. So there could be lost opportunity costs, there could be missed uh, opportunities, mistakes, things like that. All of a sudden one person, you know, you, you, you have two CMOs and you let one go and you realize after the fact that, oh, the one we let go did a whole bunch of things that this other one doesn't and they're not getting done. So, I mean, there's, it, it, it's, it's kind of complex. And the research shows that it takes you know, two to three years in terms of um, the cost of letting things go, in, in terms of opportunity cost, or if you lay people off, there's often severance, sometimes there's lawsuits. So all the costs in, it takes two to three years to capture those. And, and those are generally underestimated, the cost of cutting the cost, if you will. So, but synergy through consolidation is one that you, you'll hear a lot about. <clears throat> Second one, or a 1B, is synergy through cross-selling. And this is probably the toughest of the synergies to realize. And so the idea here is company A sells uh, TVs and company B sells, um, you know, Roku's or some sort of TV add-on. And the idea is, oh, hey, we can combine these companies. We have the same buyer, we have the same retail outlets, and we'll just sell, you know, both products. It'll be, and we can get rid of a lot of our salespeople. Uh, the reason this is difficult is because it, it sounds great in theory, but it's quite complex. 
because there's internal issues to navigate. Are the salespeople that you keep, they need to be trained to sell the new products, they need to be incented to sell the new products. Right now, they make money selling the old products and their relationships with their customers, the customers haven't asked for those other products. They, they just they just sell in TVs. Why do they care about these add-ons? They need to understand those products. <clears throat> there's marketing and messaging that goes into it, so those are all internal. There's external variables like Presumably the buyer has been purchasing those add-on products from somewhere else. Why would they get why are they gonna make a change just because you want them to make a change? So there's there's a lot that goes into that. It tends to be a lot more difficult than than companies will think on the front end. I was I worked for a company that did a huge acquisition and the whole point of it was cross-selling and in the end it, it just never panned out. One of the basic reasons it didn't is because there was never a great incentive program put in place to Incent, incent, incentivize, I don't know if that's a word today, it didn't used to be, but I think it might be. So to incentivize the salespeople to sell those other products. It really amounted to our CEO just yelling at them to sell this, sell that, you know, it's like this all kind of has to be aligned in a more thoughtful, intelligent way and our intentional way. A lot of times that's hard to do because these companies are so big and putting these things together and there's natural resistance. It, it can just be a very, very difficult thing to do. Sounds great on paper, but isn't always so simple. So an example of uh, cross-selling uh, M&A &A is, uh, there was an, it's been a couple of years now, but um, Alaska Airlines and Virgin America, or Virgin Air, yeah, I think Virgin America combined, and this was the main thing they were gonna do, is they had different, um, they just sort of have an overlapping customers, but they, the idea was that if we could get these all into one centralized single reservation platform, we'll be able to sell a whole lot more routes to our existing customer base. Actually, it looks like they've been reasonably successful in doing that, although it hasn't really reflected uh, a heck of a lot in the stock price as far as I can tell the last I looked. So it's, um, so who knows? I mean, who knows how successful they've been at that or not? I, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it, it, it hasn't, it's clearly not wildly successful. And again, it can be very, very difficult. So uh, that's one and two. Oh, by the way, one, which was cost cutting, a good example of that in the public markets was Kraft and Heinz. They came together and a lot of what they were pitching to the market was those overlapping, um, you know, basically opportunities for synergies and to kind of consolidate and cut some costs. That again, it tends to not be very politically popular, especially if jobs would be lost, but the reality is those are, you know, fairly easy synergies to capture. So third, our synergy through increased market power. Okay. And this, all of these, by the way, these, the synergy reasons for doing M&A tend to be defensively motivated. They tend to be, I, I gotta keep what's mine, I've gotta protect from competitors. It's, it's very sort of defensively driven. What we'll talk about later on with expansion, those tend to be growth oriented. Um, again, there's overlap. I mean, part of a, you know, there's always the saying that a good offense is a good defense or something like that. But, you know, basically, like, you can grow your business by being careful to protect it from competitors and things like that. But, again, they tend to be more, like, internally driven, these synergy ones. And so, increased market power, the idea is that we will have, um, you know, greater hold, a greater share of the market. And that can chill competition. That's something you never want to say. Uh, especially if you're a large public company, you've got antitrust concerns, which is the government making sure you're not getting too too big and becoming a monopoly. Um, they've got to jump through some hoops and get clearance to do deals. But the reality is there's a certain amount of market power that can help with pricing, that can help with just perceived uh, brand perception in the marketplace. And sometimes, um, you know, another reason, sometimes what they'll do, what companies will do when they're sort of looking for increased market power is they'll pitch the idea that with greater market power, it may be possible, they'll often tell this to the Federal Trade Commission when they're looking for antitrust approval, it'll be easier for us to serve a certain customers. So an example of that is T-Mobile and I believe Sprint, and it's been years since they announced that merger. I don't know if it even ever went through, if it's still pending. It's a huge one. But one of the things that they were saying is, look, it doesn't make a lot of sense as individual companies fighting against each other to bring our services into rural areas or, or you know, areas that are far out of the urban core because there's not enough business for both of us and neither will back off, right? Or it doesn't make sense for one to go in there and, 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 and hope the other doesn't come in, that kind of thing. But together, there's enough business for one unified company to serve those markets. So that's a pitch that 
that they'll make uh, to to the government, and you know, there's some some validity to that, but it's all premised really on there being less competition. So increased market power is really an effort to have less competition to be able to defend stronger margins and in pricing. Sometimes it's necessary for survival, as is as was the case with uh, XM radio and Sirius, really independently, the market wasn't really proving to be large enough for the two of them where they thought they could ultimately price the product. And they were just having uh, limits as to how much they could charge and they just weren't profitable, but coming together as one, they were their the only offering to the marketplace, which was an interesting antitrust uh, case study if you ever care about how they got that one through. But their, their, their reason for doing that is together, we will have, you know, they'll be, we won't be fighting over each other. We'll have a little bit better pricing. We'll better, better cost structure. It's really necessary for us to continue to provide this service. They're just, the marketplace will not bear to individual companies. So that's the third type of synergy. And the fourth is financial or tax related. These are easier to capture. The financial ones tend to be a little bit kind of illusory, but the, the form those often come in is, as two companies, we will have a better ability to, well, the ability more leverage to get better pricing from suppliers. We have a lower cost of capital, possibly. You know, our equity will cost lower if we can, um, you know, get a better deal with investors. We can borrow money at more favorable rates. Uh, it's kind of financial engineering, if you will. And then there's tax reasons. So sometimes a company will acquire another to, to get their net operating losses. That's complex in that it's not, there's a lot of rules around doing that, but in terms of capturing them, if, if, if it's possible from a legal perspective, actually realizing those benefits is, is not terribly, terribly difficult, but there's not, that doesn't tend to be a big driver of M&A activity, but I would put that in the fourth category of, of synergy reasons. So to sum up, consolidation, synergy through consolidation or cost cutting, cross selling, number two, increase market power number three, and the financial or tax reasons number four. So we'll have two other videos doing expansion and growth, uh, and look out for those soon.